back on the Zero Hour. I am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. Of the ending of a year, the beginning of a new year, absolutely arbitrary uh, calendar uh, event that bears uh, has no equivalent in the physical world. Nevertheless, we consider them monumental. We use them as opportunities to uh, reflect on where we've been and where we're going. And in that light, my next guest is going to help us reflect uh, maybe a little bit on the year that's passed, but more importantly on the year coming up and what, wherever else we go, we're gonna go. John Nichols is a Washington correspondent for The Nation. He is the author of numerous books, including his most recent, which I'm gonna to try to remember, recall from memory, uh, it's about Henry Wallace in 1948. I know that, but so uh, without any- I can give it to you, brother, if you want. Hit me. What is it? The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Uh, and it reflects on Henry Wallace's anti-fascist and anti-racist politics, suggesting that we could still use a little of both. And we did a whole segment on that. And, and why don't we use that as a jumping off uh, place John Nichols, because we had uh, 1948, of course, be, was the dawn of uh, uh, the elected presidency of Harry Truman. Uh, in Truman's case, the choice of a vice president was uh, portentous, even more so for FDR in 1944, because he switched from Henry Wallace to Harry Truman, making Harry Truman our president. Um, so now we have uh, a new Democratic administration coming in. We have the scramble to fill uh, appointed positions, political appointments, mm -hmm. which I've likened to Black Friday for party insiders and operatives. They're all pushing at the glass door of the yeah, new administration. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we're seeing that unfold with arguably mixed results. You, you, you've you followed the Democratic Party in American politics for a very long time. You wrote a book on socialism in America, the S word. Uh, we're seeing a Democratic Party now that is trying to find its footing, I would say, between its newly resurgent left, its uh, centrist wing, and then people who kind of orbit between the two. Um, what do you see a Biden administration and the new Congress, how do you see, let's start with that, how do you see that kind of jockeying for power playing out in 2021? Well, I see it really playing out in a big, big way. And it's it's the right place to begin any discussion about this transition of power. Um, we'll talk perhaps in a few minutes about the fact that Donald Trump is not really letting go quite yet. But at the end of the day, Joe Biden is going to be the president of the United States, and he will be sworn in on January 20th uh, with probably the most difficult task of any president since Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. And it's appropriate that Biden has won a mandate uh, from the voters, at least in the popular vote, that is the largest uh, by a challenger to a sitting president since FDR in 1932. It's quite remarkable. Uh, that despite all the challenges that the party has and, and all this, that Biden, Biden comes to office with a charge to lead. And we know how he needs to lead on the pandem pandemic, the mass unemployment that extends from it, an, an unanswered call for racial justice that goes back generations, centuries, um, a climate crisis, military industrial complex still taking way too much of our resources away from domestic needs. And every appointment that Joe Biden makes will tell you something, perhaps a great deal, about how he's going to answer that call, how he will use his mandate, how he will take the charge from the American people to give this country a different course. Uh, it's not new to say that personnel is policy and the appointments matter. So you are seeing, you're right, every Democrat line up, try and get an appointment. And we've seen a lot announced so far. I find it a very mixed bag. Some of the economic team is better than I would have expected. There are people uh, around the president and going into positions of power, even up to and including uh, Janet Yellen at, at Treasury, who are frankly not the usual Goldman Sachs crowd. 
right? Or not the usual investment banker crowd. They're a little bit better. Um, I think that in some of the foreign policy defense appointments, I'm I'm kind of seeing a lot of a lot of what you've had in the past. I don't think it's a big break from a kind of a mainstream democratic administration. The perhaps the most interesting stuff that's going on is over in the area of uh, the the cabinet agencies, the kind of the the ones that don't get as much attention as they should. Uh, I think that uh, Xavier Becerra going to uh, Health and Human Services is a good pick. And I, I you know me, I, I rarely say that something's, I'm almost always unsatisfied with cabinet picks, but I think Becerra is a good pick. He's got a history of being a supporter of Medicare for All. Um, he took on Big Pharma as Attorney General of uh, California. He, there's, there's a lot about him that says he's a good man to be in that position. Uh, I'm intrigued and sympathetic to Martha Fudge going to housing and urban development. Uh, I'm a little less excited about Tom Vilsack going to agriculture. However, Vilsack as uh, Secretary of Agriculture did some good things. He just needs to be pressed to do a lot more good things. Um, and, and we'll keep seeing, seeing these appointments come through. The bottom line is that Biden is appearing to be a little more sympathetic to the diversity of the Democratic Party than uh, some of his predecessors. And that's good. That's encouraging. But we shouldn't get overly romantic about it. There's still a brutal battle for the soul of the Democratic Party. It's a battle that goes back to the 1940s, as you generously mentioned. I've written about it. And it is always a fight between those who want to renew the full vision of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Not necessarily the policies. And remember, Roosevelt was imperfect. He didn't do everything right. Of course. He did a lot of things wrong. But that, that energetic vision, that sense that you seize government to do good for as many people as you can, hopefully to do a lot of good, um, that died with Roosevelt. There's simply no question that the New Deal uh, did not continue in the, the post-World War II era. It was renewed a little bit by Lyndon Johnson in uh, the 1960s and there, but for Vietnam, you might have had a moment, but but that got scuttled. And since then, we've seen uh, neoliberalism be very, very influential in the Democratic Party. That's the story of, of that arc of history. The intervention at this moment is, of course, Bernie Sanders's uh, 2016 and 2020 campaigns, which really raised uh, a vision of progressive politics, even embracing democratic socialism and a new generation, perhaps the most exciting intervention in our politics since the early 70s, coming into elected positions. We talk of the squad, of course, uh, Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, but also now their reinforcements from the 2020 election. Uh, Jamal Bowman, Cori Bush, Marie, Marie Newman, others coming to Congress. And so there's, there's a tension there I love that tension. I favor it. I want to have progressives pushing in and making bigger demands, uh, but I am not romantic. I will tell you that that I think there will be a lot of disappointments and a lot of struggle, and the fight for the soul of the Democratic Party is going to go on uh, very much within this administration. If I can say one last thing, Richard, just one last thing on this, sure. is that the reason this is so important, the reason we're talking about this, is because if Joe Biden does not govern as the most progressive president he can possibly be, seizing that bully pulpit, using executive orders, using whatever power he has in Congress, depending on the Georgia runoffs and things of that nature. If he does not do that, Republicans will take the House of Representatives in 2022. Uh, they will take back the presidency in 2024. And we will see something worse than Trump in the future. That's the danger we face. So it's a big, it's a big, big uh, struggle at this point, and history tells us that Democratic administrations that pull their punches uh, lose their governing power very quickly. First of all, John Nichols, hundred percent agree. Secondly, uh, I want to review a couple, uh, a couple points here, and go over them in a little more detail. One is when you look at the. Uh, the battle within the Democratic Party and the battle between the Democratic centrists and the left more broadly, there was an instantaneous pivot from throughout this election campaign, 
progressives vote for Joe Biden. He has the most progressive platform of any Democratic presidential candidate in modern history, which objectively, it didn't have everything I wanted, but was objectively true. Expansion of Social Security, you know, other things that we consider progressive. Immediately after the election, what we heard was face facts, lefties. Uh, the public wanted the moderate. He ran as a moderate. He won as a moderate. Now get out of our way so that we can govern as moderates. This was the, the like immediate bait and switch, number one. Number two, you had a House of Representatives whose leadership was adamant uh, that uh, basically the Democrats should run as blue dogs, that the squad and their allies should sit down and shut up because that telling phrase, majority makers, that belief on the part of the House leadership that the way to retain democratic control of the Senate was by being as much like Republicans as you could be while still maintaining your Democratic Party registration, a strategy that almost caught the caused them not the swing of additional seats that was predicted, but the loss of seats uh, immediately then too, we were blaming the left. Oh, it was because you lefties were running around saying defund the police. Well, Joe Biden won by a healthy majority. So obviously there was some other factor at play. So we're seeing every kind of dirty trick mustered to, uh, discredit the left and disempower the left. And yet I would argue, as you have just argued, that if the Democrats, uh, let's not forget, the Democrats won the House, the Senate, and the presidency in 2008. They lost the House in 2010. They lost uh, the Senate a few years later. Uh, they did so by uh, because uh, uh, Barack Obama proposed a grand bargain that would have cut Social Security. So, so the polling showed that uh, public confidence in the Democrats to protect Social Security fell by 25 points between 2005, 2010. We could go down issue after issue, but I, I agree with your um, your grim prediction about what will happen if the Democrats don't govern as progressives. Uh, I think Biden is a little bit of an unwritten a blank slate on how he'll govern. Uh, I think he'll need to be pressured. But I think there's going to be, you know, I don't mind a fight, but I hate the carping. And uh, so I, but I think, you know, you you, you go to a political war with the carping you're, you've been given, not the carping you wish you had. And <laughs> so, first of all, I, um, you know, assuming you agree with the above, what do you think is a smart left strategy for all of this well let's begin with uh a, a couple of a couple of things that that kind of affect strategy one way or the other uh first and foremost we don't know what will happen with the senate uh there will be two runoffs in georgia uh if by chance those runoffs elect democrats you end up in a situation where you've got a 50 50 senate and uh, then Kamala Harris, the new vice president, will break the tie and uh, give Democrats kind of some control of the Senate. I think it's very, very important not to overly be overly romantic about that because you're going to have some centrist Democrats, even some corporate Democrats, who will pull back uh, and and potentially be even more empowered to make it difficult for Democrats to necessarily govern in a progressive manner. So there's struggles there. But of course, you want the Senate because you get rid of some of the structural barriers. For instance, um, if Mitch McConnell retains control of the Senate, I would expect there will be brutal battles over cabinet picks, uh, and particularly uh, some of the better ones. I think there have already been Republicans who have stepped up and said that they are going to vote against Becerra for uh, Health and Human Services because he's very pro-choice. Uh, and so it, we recognize that those are that there's a political fight that has to be settled out immediately. Um, there's frankly also the political fight of just making sure that the Trump people, you know, at, at a baseline, accept the results of the election and, and the president continues to, to struggle in that regard. But once you get beyond those barriers, then I, I think that that it's absolutely vital that a progressives keep the pressure on on. Biden. And I think this is one of the things that progressives often forget. 
they they contribute mightily to the election of a new Democratic president, as you saw in 1976 and 1992 and 2008, again and again. And then they, they're sort of excited by that. They see hopeful signs in some of the appointments, maybe some policies, and they kind of dial back their energy um, and dial back the pressure. That can't happen this time. It can't happen for two reasons. Number one is I talked about before and you've uh, graciously acknowledged it's political suicide it's dumb to govern in a centrist or cautious way uh in general it does not it does not make things better it doesn't give you more strength it dials back your coalition doesn't extend it out which is what you seek to do franklin roosevelt proved that franklin roosevelt maintained he won the presidency four times he maintained his governing majority throughout that how did he do it well he governed big Right. And that that's a that's part of the, the answer to it. Johnson governed big and also maintained his governing majority, even though it was difficult at times. Uh, and so this is the lesson of our history, for better or worse. But then there's a second thing, and that is the moment that we are in right now is an absolutely uh, turbulent, tension filled, difficult, challenging, overwhelming moment. Uh, you've got the pandemic. You've got mass un unemployment. You've got uh unmet needs that are so huge and so overwhelming to govern in a small way is is going to fail. So pressure on Biden is a favor to him. It is not a, a burden to him. It is to the good. And where should that pressure go? Well, of course, to use executive orders wherever you can. That's difficult. It doesn't always work, but you do it um, to look for the best avenues for um, highlighting issues, even if you don't win. I think the House should vote on Medicare for all and, yeah. and endorse it. Mm -hmm. I think the House should vote on a Green New Deal and endorse it. These things are popular. I think the House should vote, as it already has to some extent, on policing reforms. These things are popular. Put those issues forward. If the Senate wants to block it, then you can talk about a do-nothing Senate. But you've got to do big things, at least where you've got the ability to do it. And finally, the biggest thing that I would emphasize, and, I, and sometimes we, I, we always lose sight of this, um, I think that progressives should advocate for accountability, and that is that progressives should be uh, at the forefront of saying that the Biden administration should not never undermine, never get in the way of prosecutors at the federal, state, and local level who want to go after Donald Trump and people associated with him who grifted, who uh, harmed us dramatically as a country, who undermined the, the public good, the common good, uh, if they've got, and I'm not saying make things up. I'm not saying, you know, find something to go after. I don't want to punish the loser of an election. That's not what I'm interested in. But where there are legitimate charges against Donald Trump and his associates, they ought to be pursued. Uh, where there are legitimate complaints against corporations that have done wrong, against banks that have done wrong, they should be pursued. Again, I'm not you know, uh, a FDR absolutist. Uh, there's a lot of other history there, but I will tell you that one of the key elements of the New Deal, way lost to our history, it was that accountability component. They were bringing bankers before the U.S. Senate to face uh, serious investigations. They put people in jail. They went after war profiteers. And that accountability message, especially coming, you know, through this pandemic and through these horrible responses to it, that matters. It's, that's a vital part of the overall process. And progressives should be very, very comfortable in raising that and pushing the administration to take it up. And I, I'm actually writing about that right now. So uh, oh, the good. accountability piece of it, because I do think it's important. First of all, uh, you know, criminal uh, uh, law enforcement theories has deterrence is the only thing that prevents recurrence of crime. But secondly, you know, we have a disaffected, a population. We have millions of people who believe the system doesn't work for them because it doesn't. And won't, it's, it's only, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's one way to restore faith in the system. And uh, it's the right thing to do. So I, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree with all of that more. Uh, one of the things that I've been pondering, and again, we're talking with John Nichols, Washington correspondent for the nation. Uh, one of the things that I've been pondering uh, is as these uh, appointments and nominations get announced uh, from the Biden team is uh, the proper left reaction to it uh, strategically. And what I mean by that is uh, I'm a real, I like to think I'm a realist. 
And I don't expect that very many of, uh, of the people appointed to the Biden administration, the cabinet or elsewhere, are going to be my first choices. I mean, I don't think we're going to get, you know, the kind of left thinkers and leaders that I might pick. I just think that I'm not expecting that. So I'm not embittered or disappointed when that doesn't happen. I just acknowledge we're still moving the center of power. But uh, obviously, there are going to be appointments I like better than others. You mentioned Javier Becerra, very, you know, quite happy about that. There are others not so happy about. But tactically, I wonder about the best way to respond, because I feel that on the, you know, I, I feel as if my mission statement for the left is harm mitigation while we're on the road to fundamental change. And the harm mitigation piece of that could be harmed. For example, if 10 of us go out and say, uh, Janet Yellen is a loathsome choice for Treasury Secretary, but I'm still pondering this. I'm thinking like, because she was on the board of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, which is a right-wing budget-cutting anti-social security group. Well, yeah, I can hammer her over that. Uh, and we as a movement can hammer her over that. And to what extent is that the right approach versus, look, you know, we weren't going to get uh, you know, Richard Wolf as Treasury Secretary. So let's just accept that and see what we can get out of, see how we, well, we can lobby Janet Yellen without, you know, laying into her. So I go back and forth on that question. I'm curious to know if you have any thoughts about that, sure. John. I do. And I think about it a lot, the same as you do, uh, it, it, for exactly the same reasons. And I think the trick on this is pick your battles, right? Um, understand where you want to fight. And, and fight in the appropriate places. Uh, what that means is if you're getting 80%, probably you don't fight, right? You're getting down in the you know 50%, that's where you, you fight. And if you're getting below that, then of course, you know, you definitely do. And and um, different groups will have different nuances on that, different histories and, and concerns. Uh, the best, of course, is to pull all these groups together into the strongest coalition you've got. I see two core responsibilities. One, uh, make sure that the really bad people don't get in. And so I've written a lot about Rahm Emanuel. Right. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I think yeah, I agree with the people in Chicago who say this guy should not be in the administration. Um, I agree also with AOC on that and, and other folks who've really raised all sorts of deep concerns. And we've done that as regards some other possible picks, I think, with, you know, some potential success. We'll see uh, on, on kind of challenging potential directions the administration might go. That's one side of it. And then you play that out into the nomination fight. I think there, it, there could be a circumstance where progressives might say, look, um, the president has chosen poorly and we're not going to, we're not going to support this, this nominee. If you get a bad enough one and you, you make that message come through, but, um, and this is the big, but, and I think it's important. Progressives also have to not, expend all their energy on fighting against what they don't want. Sometimes they have to also put energy into fighting for what they do want. And I want to emphasize, I think that there will be a major effort to try and block Xavier Becerra from being Secretary of Health and Human Services. I think that effort to block him will uh, get some traction. I don't know how much in, among Republican senators but they will go big on the fact that he has been very pro-choice, very supportive of LGBTQ rights, um, and frankly, that he is pretty progressive on a lot of health care issues. And so um, progressives need to be at the ready to make sure that that nomination gets through. And similarly, where there are other good picks, uh, I think, you know, Martha Fudge, again, going to uh, HUD, uh, these are folks you want to make sure they get approved. And and so I think they will, by the way, I, I, I'm not saying that it isn't going to happen, but that's using your energy uh, in multiple directions, but making sure at the end of the day that um, supporting some challenging others, you end up with the most progressive cabinet possible. Again, this isn't just to add up wins and losses or to make a point or even about, you know, the fight for the direction of the party. This is also about that core concept, personnel as policy, 
that if you don't have the right people in charge of these cabinet agencies, you lose a lot of possibility. And I, I give you just one core example on that, Secretary of Labor. The Secretary of Labor um, has a massive staff, thousands and thousands of people, tens of billions of dollars in budget, right? Or, you know, a huge budget or both direct and things that it affects. And, and you have so much power, so much potential in that agency. You, how you do labor statistics tells us the real unemployment rate. How you do labor statistics tells us um, whether uh, there is structural racism and where it is, because it clearly is there and we can identify it. Um, and then you move beyond that. If you've got a secretary of labor who you know, bends toward keeping workers safe on the job, not just in speaking up on the issue, but also in implementing regulations and pushing for it. It's how you use all of those levers. Um, there's tremendous power there. So that's why I want the right people in charge of these agencies, because it isn't just about the win or the loss. It's what they will do over the next four years. Well, I think that's exactly right, John Nichols. And all this leads up for me uh, to the sort of reflections I've been doing as we enter into this new uh, political era of, uh, of a Biden administration. And I think just kind of accumulated emotional uh, baggage over the last few years, which is for me, uh, going back even 15, 20 years in my own writing, I don't want to be the snarky negative guy anymore. I don't want, and I don't want a left that is strictly, you mentioned, you know, affirmative, you know, the things we should support in the context of appointments. But I think even more broadly, the left needs to be sort of a, a beacon of an, a, a positive and affirmative vision of what this country and this world can be, as opposed to reacting to every horrific thing that a Trump or for that matter, a Biden may do in the years to come. It's important to do those things. I wrote about Rahm Emanuel too, but I used polling data to you know, say, well, what he's done is against what voters want, as opposed to negative things about Rahm Emanuel as a person, which I might've written 10 years ago, probably did. But um, I, well, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, a, you know, I feel, and I really love your thoughts on this, I feel as if we as the left need to be talking about uh, an affirmative sense of, you know, not just Green New Deal as a phrase, for example, mm -hmm. but what it would mean to every community where, uh, in every congressional district where there's a race, what it would mean to that district if we had jobs, a a if we had green jobs, if we were cleaning up the environment, if people, had a, 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 you know clean water to drink and and so on. If we talk about infrastructure, talk about the bridges that would be built. Talk uh, talk about the jobs. You know, we could go down the whole laundry, Medicare for all. Just talk about you know if your kid gets sick, you don't have to worry about paying the rent this month. You know those, those types of things. So I feel you know I've certainly done my share of you know, complaining and negativity, and there'll be times for that. But I feel now it's, if I'm going to criticize Joe Biden, it's going to be, you can do better. It, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, oh, here they go again. Um, and I'm seeing, uh, I, I'd like to bring others with me on that shift, but maybe I'm being ludicrously Pollyanna-ish. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I... Look, I'm always glad to call you ludicrous, um, yes, but, okay. yes, uh, but uh, in this case, I, I think you're, you're working your way around uh, a fundamental reality of 2020 that we ought to take in and, um, and respect. So I tend to, to uh, side with you on, on quite a bit of this, and here's why. I think that there's a real explanation, not the one that, that the corporate Democrats and centrist Democrats peddle, not, certainly not the one that John Kasich's running around peddling and stuff like that, uh, uh, for why Democrats didn't do as well as they thought they would in 2020. And I think the real explanation for that is that 
they ran too much against Donald Trump and not enough in favor of what they sought to accomplish, not filling out a vision of what they could do. And, and I'll give you an example of why I think we've got the proof of that. Uh, Joe Biden did win by 7 million votes nationally. His percentage of the popular vote is greater than Ronald Reagan in 1980, than Bill Clinton in 92 or 96, than George Bush in uh, 2000 or 2004, and then Barack Obama in 2012. I mean, this is, he got a lot, he got a very solid victory here. I mean, that's just the, the simple reality of it. And yet that didn't filter down to the level that people wanted in the Senate races and congressional races and legislative races. And so what, how do we, what do we take away from that? Well, I think what you take away is that um, it was very clear if you voted for Joe Biden, you got rid of Donald Trump. Right. That's and that's one part of the equation, a very good part of the equation, a very necessary part of it. But then when you got down into those Senate races, when you got down into the House races, it you know, that wasn't that wasn't Trump. It wasn't there wasn't a clarity there. Um, I think that you could have made it clear by talking about the failure to vote for impeachment. I actually would have made a bigger issue of that in some of the against some of these Republican senators. But more importantly, a positive message as regards what a Democratic administration could do. And so you say, yeah, you want to elect this member of Congress because you want somebody who's going to be voting for a, I would argue, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, et cetera. But even if you dialed back a little bit of that, you mentioned at the start, Richard, that the Democratic Party had its most progressive platform in modern times. The truth is it's not, in the perspective of the times, it's not particularly more progressive than the Democratic platform of uh, certainly not in 72 when McGovern and his people had a very progressive platform, but didn't win. Uh, mm -hmm. Frankly, the Democratic platform in 60 and 64 was strikingly progressive in the, especially 64 in the context of the times. And, and you go back to those FDR platforms, they too were strikingly progressive. And so there's always, you know, there's been a history that the key is what do you do with what you say, right? right? How much do you take that progressive plan Sure. And so the Democrats put all this energy into scoping out a plan on COVID, right? It's in their platform. I read it. It was actually pretty good. And on job creation, it was pretty good. But I didn't hear Joe Biden or Democratic candidates up and down the line saying, you elect us an A, B, C, D, right. E, F, G will occur. Right. No, I couldn't agree with you more. I, and I also think there's a fundamental, you know, uh, the resistance, a hashtag resistance. It, it, it's pushing back against something that's pushing you. Well, as yeah. opposed to seizing the momentum, it's, you know, we know what you hate. Tell us yeah. what you love. I love people having financial security. Healthcare. I love people having health care. I love a plan at this level. You, you, it, yeah. you know, it all flows from that. So there's the psychology too. But you know, I, I completely agree with you. And I know that Biden didn't run on that platform. He ran against a relief from Trump. But even at least there, there was something positive, which is, oh, yeah, he'll be a it's nice good guy. To get rid of, he'll be it's civil. good to get rid of Trump, yeah. right? It's good to get rid of Trump. But getting rid of Trump is pulling the sliver out, right? So you're not in pain anymore. You know, you don't have that 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 pain, that 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 uh, difficulty. Uh, but there's also more than that. You don't want to just relieve the pain. You want to, um, you know, move to that that better, more fully realized life, that 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 future. And the weird part is there's an intersection of the relief of pain and the better life in this covid moment. Right. We yeah. have a pandemic. We have mass unemployment. Um and, and so there's clearly an urgency. There's clearly a need for action to find the action. And again, I think that now that the election is done, um, you still have that demand to define the action. Uh, I think Joe Biden has a moral duty to give the best inaugural address in the history of the country. Right. I mean, period, because he's got to frame out a vision and he's got to get people excited about it. So does Kamala Harris. So. Uh, frankly, do you, you know, all these Democrats and the best way to do that is to get on the same page, right? Uh, mm -hmm. as best they can. I know they're it's very hard to do, but get them on the same page and have that coherent message, make it loud enough so that 
then Republicans start to realize some of these issues we've got to go along with, not because we want to. I mean, we resisted it every way we could, but because it's clearly so popular that we've got to let some of this happen. Well, and and because most people need change in their lives, it's not a time for a Democratic members of Congress to be what I call the Elmer Fudd Democrats. Yeah. Be very, very still. Don't let them notice that you're there and you'll maybe you'll get reelected. Is they're gonna say, look, this is what we're gonna do for you. Unfortunately, John Nichols, we're gonna to have to leave it there. Um, but I will give you 30 seconds for the last word, if you like the it. La the last word is that the most important thing in this period is going to be uh, tr truth telling and transparency and getting the message out. And so shows like this really, really matter. And um, if folks have an opportunity to support what you're doing, they should do so, uh, because we are going to need an independent left critique of uh, Democrats and Republicans in this period going forward. We're going to need a lot of truth telling. This is going to be a difficult time. And independent media, independent progressive media is a huge part of that. And thank you for that. And for more truth telling, you can look up John Nichols writing at The Nation. And as always, John Nichols, Washington correspondent for The Nation. Great pleasure talking with you, my friend. And thanks for coming on the program. It's an honor to be with you, my friend. We'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour. Yeah.